us, we might see things that distress us, political issues, violence, people's behaviour during COVID, even people in churches who've done terrible things. And there's a certain amount that we can do and we can change our own behaviour, perhaps, with God's help, but we can't change the root cause, the sin that's embedded in human hearts. Only God can through his Holy Spirit. Habakkuk li lived in around 600 BC when the kingdom of Judah was a mess. Judah were God's chosen people. They were supposed to reflect God's character in how they lived. They certainly didn't. Everywhere Habakkuk looked, he saw violence, injustice, wrongdoing, strife, conflict. God's good law that was meant to help people draw close to God and care for each other was paralysed, he said. And so Habakkuk cried out to God, the only one who could really fix the sin and mess all around him. And Dan's going to read a few verses from early in Habakkuk for us. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm reading from Habakkuk verse 1. Chapter one, sorry, as well. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Look at the Lord's nation and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings, not their own, they are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honour. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have been appointed, sorry, you, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Thank you, Dan. So Habakkuk essentially complained to God, how long do I have to cry out to you? You don't listen, he thought. Why do you tolerate this behaviour from your people? He was blisteringly honest with God. And the book of Habakkuk records his sort of prayer conversation with God. Habakkuk blurted out his concerns, but he also needed to be quiet and listen when God answered. And he had a great deal of trouble getting his head around what God planned to do. To sort out Judah's sin, God was going to send the Babylonians, ruthless conquerors, feared and dreaded. Now, imagine for a moment that we prayed, Lord, fix the problems in the churches in Australia. We might see people who are lukewarm. There's been issues of sexual sin. And these things distress us. So supposing we prayed that and God said, yes, I'm going to sort it out. I'm going to send North Korea. We would be outraged we would be thinking, they're so much worse than we are. How can God tolerate their evil? Kim Jong-un is supposed to have had one of his uncles executed for falling asleep in a meeting. And you're going to use them to correct us? Can you start to imagine what this must have been like for Habakkuk? It's something of what he was feeling. But we still don't get the full impact. We live in a largely stable and secure country. Most of us don't know what it feels like to fear invaders. But God uses vivid language as he speaks with Habakkuk 
to show he understands. Imagine, or try to imagine, a leopard rushing at you or a wolf. God said Babylon's horses were swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk, verse 8, and they would be coming to get you. That's what the Babylonians were like, powerful, arrogant, ruthless, self-confident, and God knew that. Still, these were the people he chose to use to discipline his own people, Judah, because Judah had stubbornly defied and rejected him, their covenant Lord. That was round one of the conversation. Round two, Habakkuk responds. In verse 12, he acknowledges, God, you are good and holy, so how can you use the Babylonians against your own people, like North Korea against us? But even though Habakkuk couldn't really understand God's plan, he says, beginning of chapter 2, I will stand at my watch. I will look to see what God will say to me. And the Lord answered again, essentially saying, I know what they're like. You keep living by faith. You remain faithful. Chapter 2, verse 4. The righteous person will live by faith. Some translations have by faithfulness. It boils down to the same thing. We will trust God and be faithful to him. God goes on to say, verses 6 to 19, I will then deal with Babylon. These plunderers will be plundered. These proud thieves will be shamed. But he also says in chapter 2, verse 14, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 2.20, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. I'm in control. Shh says God. That's the second round of the conversation. Round three, Habakkuk again responds in prayer. God's given him a lot to think about. And he says, chapter three, I, will, I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In wrath, remember mercy. He accepts God's answer. He asks for mercy because he, he doesn't like what's coming, but he accepts God's answer. And Habakkuk goes on to praise God for his glory that covered the heavens, his splendour like the sunrise, his earth-shaking power. And in this prayer, Habakkuk sort of saw in his mind's eye wicked, ungodly Babylon destroyed which ultimately happened. But Habakkuk knew these invaders were coming. Listen to his fear. 316. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet, he says, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. I will wait for Babylon to get their just desserts. Habakkuk has got to the point of saying God is God. He will deal with Judah's sin and he will also deal with the sin of the people he used to punish Judah. Habakkuk then makes the most amazing statement of faith, 3, 17 to 19. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, 
Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. Some of us might remember a song, though the fig tree does not blossom, it was bouncy and, well, trite. <laughs> it missed the depth of what Habakkuk was saying here. Some people today think it's dreadful if there's no toilet paper or pasta on supermarket shelves. But Habakkuk was talking about complete famine. No figs, grapes, olives, crops, sheep or cattle. Nothing to live on. And that was what could happen if an army invaded you. They'd strip everything and not care if survivors starved. Even then, Habakkuk says, even then I will rejoice in God my Saviour. He could find joy not in his circumstances, but in who God is. The Lord is his strength. In fact, even in those circumstances, he'd be like a deer sort of sproinging around on a mountain with joy. That's the way he describes it. So let's take a step back and look at the path Habakkuk's taken. Round one, Lord, you're not listening. You're not dealing with your people's sin. God answers, yes, I'll sort it out with the Babylonians. Round two of the prayer, you can't be serious, God. You're holy. How can you use these pagan Babylonians against us, your people? But I'll wait and I'll listen so I can explain this to your people. God's answer, you live by faith. You live faithfully. I'll deal with them. I'm in my holy temple. I'm God. Round three. Yes, Lord, it's right for you to punish us and the Babylonians, but please show mercy. Much as I don't like it, Habakkuk says, this is what you've decided. I'll wait patiently for it all to happen. Your God, you get to decide. And even then, when we face starvation, I will rejoice in you, my saviour. You're my strength and my joy. How far has Habakkuk come? His understanding and faith have matured. But as for us, we're thinking about how we draw near to God. So how did Habakkuk do that? He brought his distress to God. We can do the same. God is the only one who can fix human hearts. Habakkuk came to God with brutal honesty. He complained, why aren't you doing something, God? We can be honest with God. Sometimes we're angry with him or disappointed in him. If we pretend we're not, we are not fooling God. When we honestly bring our pain, our anger, disappointment, frustration to God, we put ourselves in a place where we can listen to him and grow. It's like inviting him in to our deep hurts, being willing for him to change us. Habakkuk was willing to listen to God even when the answer was one he would never have expected and certainly didn't want. Sometimes we get those answers to our prayers. Perhaps if we have financial trouble or broken relationships or a diagnosis, we pray for healing, but the answer's no. Or the answer is yes, ultimate healing to be with the Lord. And when that happens, the righteous live by faith. We remain faithful. We trust in God's mercy, grace and goodness. This is where the rubber of faith hits the road. 
Habakkuk discovered that his joy and strength did not depend on his circumstances, but on the Lord his God. It's so hard to learn this. And usually we only do it when we're faced with hardship. We lose loved ones, jobs, our health. Sometimes our world falls apart. But one thing that cannot be taken from us is our relationship with God, the one we can talk honestly with, the one we can bring our pain and our concerns to. And we know that Jesus lived a human life. He experienced loss and suffering. He understands what we're going through. Habakkuk isn't necessarily an easy book, but it's deeply encouraging. It shows us God is patient and holds back from punishing evil, but not forever. He will discipline, but he'll be fair. He is both holy and just. He punishes and he rescues. If when we come to God, all we want to do is whinge, God's not too impressed with that. But if, like Habakkuk, we come with honest and real questions, God accepts that. Habakkuk didn't understand how a holy God, how a good God, could allow or do certain things. And when he brought these complaints to God, God coped with that. I guess God could have maybe crushed Habakkuk like a bug for impertinence. He didn't. Instead, he graciously engaged with Habakkuk in this conversation. When Habakkuk drew near, God did not turn him away. God stretched Habakkuk, allowed him to see more and helped him to grow. This is a God we can trust, one we can and need to draw near to. The sovereign Lord is our strength. He's also a God people need to know. We need to tell them about him. He's there. He's in control, especially when life looks like it's out of control. He sent Jesus to die for us. And because of Jesus, he welcomes anyone who comes to him. Even if, at first, we come to just blurt out our pain, like Habakkuk. Our God is one worth sharing with people. They need to know him, the one who can change human hearts. Thanks. Thanks, Dan.